in tackling this enormous task of classifying all the different species on Earth, we need to start with a Swedish scientist named Carl Linnaeus. He was the first to come up with a system of classification, and he used what are now called phonetics. So Linnaeus, we saw in the last lecture, was a proponent of natural theology. And his motivation for classifying all the different organisms on Earth was, as he says, the study of nature will reveal the divine order of God's creation, and it's the naturalist's task to construct a natural classification that will reveal this order in the universe. And his first system to try to understand the relationships between different species, at least just to put them on different pigeonholes and to have some sort of ordering of these things, was his system natura from 1735. Now, in setting out to understand what Linnaeus did and then also to use that as a foundation for modern classification, we need to know a few more terms. The first is just the term taxon. And this is a classification category for a group of organisms. And as we'll see, a taxon can sometimes be very precise and sometimes it's rather general. Now, Linnaeus had a hierarchical system of biological classification and he had from very precise measures of a taxon to higher levels of taxa, that's the plural of taxon. And so we still use his system where we start with the species. We recognize that an elephant is different from a giraffe. So we have all these different species, but there may be a number of similar species that would belong in the same genus. And then again, there may be a number of genera that all share enough common characteristics from physical similarity that we'd classify them in the same family. And then broader degrees of similarity would say that these families belonged in the same order. Likewise, several orders belong in the same class, up to the phylum, and then finally up to the kingdom. Now, this is one of the few things that I really want people to memorize in this course so that you have a sense of this hierarchical classification system. And a useful way to memorize these rankings is something like this. King Philip came over from Greece Saturday. So king, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And that goes from the very broad general classification down to the specific. Now, Linnaeus then had that hierarchical system going from species all the way up to kingdom. And his other great contribution that we still use today is what's called the binomial nomenclature so that every species on Earth is given a two-word name, and that consists of their genus name and the species name. And it doesn't matter if it's a plant or an animal. So here is the French rose, and this has its Latin name or its binomial is Rosa Gallica. This bird is the Blackburnian warbler, and it too has a genus name, Dendroica, and a species named Fusca. So we would say the Blackburnian warbler is Dendroica fusca with its genus and species name. So as we go through this taxonomic hierarchy, we will start with the species. And so we just saw Rosa gallica. It's also known as the moss rose, and that's a species. And for this bird over here, the Blackburnian warbler, there's Dendroica fusca. Okay. Now we have very specific designations at the species level, as the name implies, and then we're going to go up to less specific, broader classificatory unit as we work our way up to the kingdom. So Rosa Gallica is one of 500 different species in the genus Rosa. There's 500 different kinds of roses, in other words, and of these, the genera is the plural for genus, Rosa being one genus that belongs in the family Roseaceae, and that has altogether 3,500 species. And the family Rosaceae belongs with some other families in the order Rosales, which is 18,000 species. Then these various different orders belong in Eudicotylidini, which is a class of plants. And there's 235,000 species of those. And there's several classes of plants that belong in the phylum Angiosperm, of which there's 250,000 species. And we go all the way up to the plant kingdom. So all the plants in the world, all the different kinds belong in the plant kingdom. And there's 275,000 different species. And if we go over here now to the bird, we work our way up. 
There's a bunch of species in the genus Dendroica, a bunch of genera in the family Perulidae, which belong in the order Passeriformes, which are aves, that is birds. There's 8,600 species of birds. That's a class of chordates or vertebrates. That's in the phylum Chordata, of which there's 40,000 species. And they all belong in the animal kingdom, of which is over a million species. So you get the very specific, the very narrow defined term that means a black burning warbler, nothing else, but then you get to broader and broader classificatory units as you go all the way up to kingdom. Now, but prior to Linnaeus, the proper scientific names for organisms were really kind of clumsy and crazy. So here's a bunch of tomatoes, okay? They're all the same species. There's a different varieties of tomato. And before Linnaeus, the proper scientific name for this plant was Solanum, Kale, Enerme, Herbaceo, Folis, Pinatus, Incis, Racemus, Simplicibus, which is like a long sentence describing it. And in fact, you translate that, and that means Solanum with a smooth, herbaceous stem, incised pinnate leaves, and a simple inflorescence. Well, Linnaeus came along and simplified everything down to just those two words. And so the Linnaean species name, the binomial for tomato, is simply Solanum like a persicum. Still a tomato, same as before, but now we know that when you say Solanum like a persicum, we have the tomato. And for some reason, like a persicum, I have no idea why it has that species name. You translate like a persicum, that means wolf peach. I can't explain that, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so that's Linnaeus' hierarchical system of biological classification. Species, very specific, a little bit more general to genus, and then a family of genera all the way up to kingdoms, okay? And kingdom, according to Linnaeus, was the highest classificatory unit. Now, that was perfectly fine in the 1700s when he developed this system. But as we look now, we have much more advanced and much more precise tools. We can see a lot of microorganisms. There's a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of single-celled organisms called protists. And we need to include them in there. And in fact, for a long time, after the invention of microscopes and a much more precise understanding of microbiology, the highest level of classification was still the kingdom. And there were two different kinds of bacteria, these single-celled organisms with, that have nucleated cells called protists, as well as the obvious multicellular organisms, the animals, plants, and fungus. And so we now have, though, a recognition because we're concerned with the evolutionary relationships between these different groups, that we need to have a higher level of classification, that in fact there's a domain. And so modern classification, so this is really the only change that's happened with Linnaeus's original system that he developed in the 1700s, has been to, hide the, to add this one higher level of classification, and that's to include the domain, which has several different kingdoms. And so there are three different domains in the modern classificatory system. The eubacteria, and then another group of bacteria that, uh, that superficially may look very similar, but they're really, really different from each other. And then there's this third domain, all of the organisms on Earth that have nucleated cells. So that includes the animals, plants, fungus, plus these little single-celled things called protists. So we have now a classificatory system that can try to, we can use as modern evolutionary biologists to look at the relationships between all living things. And we have at the bottom down here, because these would be the first living things on Earth, what are called the prokaryotes. These are the two different kinds of bacteria, the archaebacteria and the eubacteria, neither of which have nucleated cells. Then we have the protists, and from them gave rise the multicellular plants, fungus, and animals. So traditionally, until recently, having these big classifications of the plants, animals, fungus as the multicellular kingdoms, the protists as a fourth, and the two different kinds of bacteria as fifth and sixth. That was a six kingdom classificatory system. And you may encounter that sometimes in an old textbook or in your wanderings in your future life. But in fact, we now recognize that the highest unit should be the domain. 
And so there's this main group of eubacteria, also simply referred to as bacteria. The archaebacteria are sometimes referred to as archaea. And then all the eukaryotes over here. And we do this as we'll, I'm getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here because we're now looking at evolutionary relationships, which Linnaeus was not concerned about. These domains are defined because first in the protists we have nucleated cells and from them gave rise to the animals, fungus, and plants. And in fact, there's not that much evolutionary distance between the animals, fungus, and plants compared to the evolutionary distance between the eukaryotes and each of the main groups of bacteria. So the domain is now viewed as the catch-all, this highest classificatory unit, and it's based on these evolutionary affinities. So if we want to add to our memory device the domain going from the broadest classificatory unit, domain, kingdom, phylum, etc., just remember, Dad, King Philip, came over from Greece on Saturday. So, when we approach classification, we can do that way that Linnaeus did it, which is based solely on physical similarity. He would say things looked a lot alike, and so therefore they should be put in the same pigeonhole or in the, maybe in the same room in our classificatory system. That's phonetic based on phenotype, so you're just looking at superficial appearances. And so, for example, we might then classify a group called pandas because at least somebody once upon a time thought that, well, you know, pandas, whether they're giant pandas or red pandas, they should probably be in the same unit. And there might be such a thing as a panda as a, maybe a family. So this is okay if all you're trying to do is to put things in pigeonholes or put them in the various different rooms that you might have for your classification. And this is all that Linnaeus wanted to do. He wasn't thinking about evolution. He thought species were all created simultaneously and they never changed. So these physical similarities would say something about the circumstances of their creation, not about their evolution. Now, even though Linnaeus had what now is a very old-fashioned and, in fact, widely discarded view, he was nevertheless a first-rate scientist. His hierarchical system we still use, his Latin binomials we'll still use, and he was very good at recognizing more and more traits, physical characteristics, with which he could base his classifications. So, in 1735, he published his first version of System Natura. It was only 11 pages long. But he kept revising it, and by 1767, in his 13th edition, it was 3,000 pages long. So in the first edition, he mistakenly thought that whales were the same as fishes. I mean, they both swim in the water, right? But by 1767, he knew more about whales. He knew that they had to breathe. He knew they had different kinds of skeletons than fishes. And so, wow, whales are actually mammals. They have milk. So he was very flexible in his classifications, and he was basing them on as many different characteristics as he could find, and that made him a really good scientist. Now, later on, Linnaeus's view about trying to, you know, understand the mind of the Creator based on taxonomy, uh, this, this was kind of dismissed and is not, of course, accepted by modern evolutionary biologists. And the first person to say something uh, rather humorous about this that has stuck with us was the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane, uh, who lived up until 1964. And when he was asked what insights taxonomy had actually revealed about the mind of the Creator, Haldane replied, an inordinate fondness for beetles. Because if there was a, a Creator that simultaneously made all of these different living things, he sure made an awful lot of beetles. He said that at a time when beetles comprised about 50% of known species. And even today, about a third of all multicellular species are beetles. So they are disproportionately common, but we don't think that that's anything special from the mind of the Creator. But as we'll see, it tells us a lot about the evolutionary process called speciation, which will be the topic of a later lecture.